Casual Birder podcast, a weekly podcast for people interested in the birds they find around them. I'm Susie Buttress. This week, I spend time doing the most casual of birding, sitting in my garden and seeing what visits. And the featured birds are the red-legged partridge and California quail. I had a couple of opportunities to sit in the garden this week, under the sunshade, while creating the podcast. I love being out in the garden for long periods as the birds start getting used to you being there and will come relatively close as long as you don't move. There have been quite a variety of birds hanging out in the garden, particularly a young brook, the red-legged partridge, the teenage magpies that attacked my washing last week, a couple of blackbirds and some wood pigeons, green finches, goldfinches and blue tits. Oh, and a sparrowhawk that flew into the garden and landed for a split second on the water feature. I realised what it was in the same split second it realised I was there, and it flew off almost immediately. But I can still remember seeing it standing there, wings outstretched as it landed, if only I had kept my camera with me. I noticed an interesting interaction between a juvenile wood pigeon and an adult jackdaw. The wood pigeon had been eating seed at one of the ground feeders, and a jackdaw approached to also get some seed. Mostly the wood pigeons don't mind the jackdaws and rooks that visit my garden, so I was quite surprised to see the wood pigeon display aggression towards the jackdaw, as was the jackdaw apparently. The wood pigeon raised itself up tall and thin and stared at the jackdaw. I always think this makes the wood pigeon look quite affronted. The jackdaw didn't really notice and carried on trying to get some seed, So the wood pigeon upped its game and threw some mock pecks at the jackdaw. This gave the jackdaw pause for a moment, but he still tried to eat the seed. Clearly, this further antagonised the young wood pigeon, which then threw some wing swipes at the jackdaw. This finally had the intended effect and the jackdaw moved off. But it made me think about the difference between species regarding the behaviours that show dominance or display territorial boundaries and how they might differ and therefore not be understood by other species. It appeared that the jackdaw was not picking up on the visual cues from the wood pigeon that it was feeling upset. The only time it responded in a way that the wood pigeon desired, that is, moved away from the feeder, was when the wood pigeon almost made, or perhaps did make, body contact via the wing slapping. I thought about the ways I've seen wood pigeons assert dominance before. There's a hierarchy of escalation, and the challenges follow a pattern. For example, if it had been two wood pigeons at the ground feeder, initially the aggrieved bird would stand very upright and stare at the opponent, waiting to see what the next move will be. If the opponent walks off, the wood pigeon will relax its stance and go back to feeding. However, if the opponent mirrors the upright stance, they will stare at each other, maintaining the upright stretch and watching each other's movements. The slightest indication from either bird of closing the gap between them will result in the next phase where the bird feeling threatened will jab its head at the other in short repeated motions. The slightest indication from either bird of closing the gap between them will result in the next phase where the bird feeling threatened will jab its head at the other in short repeated motions, perhaps to make plain that a peck is imminent. If that doesn't have the desired effect, the bird feeling threatened will flap its wing towards the opponent, a move which may be reciprocated. Again, this may be repeated by the birds many times. If neither bird backs down, this can escalate into full-on fighting, where the birds will use their wings to hit the other bird, often flying after the aggressor to inflict more hits. The noise of the wing flaps is very loud, and when the birds are chasing each other and tumbling through tree branches, I'm often quite concerned that one of the birds will end up badly injured. One thing to note through all of this is that the wood pigeons remain silent through the escalations. I compared this sequence of events to the dominance displays I've observed with jackdaws. When jackdaws argue, the involved birds fluff up their feathers and the silver grey neck feathers are erected, making them especially noticeable. Jackdaws also make petulant squawky noises in fast repeated cadence. Generally, the less dominant bird will back down quite quickly. Given these signals, it's not surprising that the jackdaw did not respond to the tall, thin and silent wood pigeon, as it would have to a fluffed up and squawking jackdaw. 
but it did respond to the possibility of being hit by the wood pigeon's wing. I think in this case, it seemed the jackdaw didn't really want to engage with the wood pigeon. It was clearly just wanting to get seed. But as it was a juvenile wood pigeon, it might have been testing out what it could and couldn't do with other birds. And maybe it's just learned that it can frighten off its own species, and so it tried it with the jackdaw too. I'm going to look out for these interactions between the species. It's uh, made me quite interested to see how it plays out with other ones. A quick note about the regions. My bird descriptions come from the observations I've made over the years. I live in England, and this podcast primarily features birds found in the UK. However, I have been lucky enough to vacation in other countries, and I'll feature birds I've seen in those countries too. I also have listeners from around the world, and I welcome birding comments or observations from all. If you want further information on identification, there are various sites online that are worth checking out such as the RSPB Bird Identifier, found at rspb.org.uk, or the Audubon Guide to North American Birds, found at audubon.org. This week's featured birds are the red-legged partridge and California quail. Regular listeners will know that we inexplicably have a red-legged partridge living in my neighbourhood. We had a pair originally, but about four weeks ago the male disappeared. The female is still visiting. I say inexplicably because their normal habitat is farmland or grassland. Red-legged partridges are native to southern France, Spain and northern Italy. They were introduced to Britain as game birds. There are now resident breeding populations found in rural areas all over England. There are some records of this species being found in urban and suburban locations, but until I saw these birds regularly visiting, I would not have believed it. They are very recognisably a game bird quite quail-like, with a squat, plump body, downward-pointing tail and short wings. They have sturdy legs on which they walk or run. Size-wise, they're midway between a collared dove and a wood pigeon, somewhere between the size of a large aubergine or eggplant or a small pumpkin. We had both male and female visiting, and the sexes look alike, so how could I tell them apart? Well, I made an assumption based on the male being slightly bigger and the female had two areas on her head where her feathers wouldn't lie flat. Having seen how pigeons mate, I presumed that this was due to being mussed by the male's beak while mating, but in fact those mussed up feathers are still present now, many weeks later, so it must just be an aberration in her feathers. I'm still calling her a she though. Their plumage is really striking a mix of plain colours and complex patterns. The top of the head, back and upper breast is mid-brown, changing to grey tones on the rump and mid-breast, and the belly is a rich cinnamon. The beautiful patterned parts of the plumage will be a challenge to describe. The face is creamy beige with a black line through it, extending from the beak, through the eye and around the throat. This also gives the impression of a pale eyebrow. From the throat to the top of the breast is a black speckled area which looks like a necklace. The sides are a broken pattern, repeated scallops of grey feathers with cinnamon and black edging. In the scrubland where they're usually found this gives excellent camouflage. In my garden, which has a mix of greenery, dead twigs and bare earth, don't judge, they are equally hidden. I have been astounded how many times I've gone up to top up the feeders or the bird bath having first checked that the partridge was not around, and she's flown up onto the fence and scared me with the suddenness. When they fly, their wings make a whirring sound. They have red legs, hence the name, a stout, slightly downward curving red beak, and red eye rings. When the male was nearby, he would make short, plaintive, rising calls, almost like he was checking where his mate was. They kind of went, Aww! They also make a clucking call to remain in contact with each other, and I've got an example of that here. (coughs) 
Before he disappeared, the male started to make very loud territorial calls, which started quietly and built up to a crescendo. Red-legged partridges eat mainly seed and roots, and I've watched them grazing on the grass on our lawn. They eat insects too during the breeding season. They're mostly ground-living birds. From my observations, they spend a large proportion of their time preening or dozing when not eating. When settled and comfortable, they walk at a very slow pace, sometimes pausing before lifting their foot off the ground to complete the next step. When alarmed, they raise their heads up and become more thin and tall, and they can run very quickly. Partridges rely on their plumage providing camouflage and will remain hidden until you are really close before bursting into the air from almost under your feet and giving you a bit of a shock. Having a red-legged partridge at such close quarters has given me an opportunity to observe behaviours you'd rarely witness in the wild. I had noticed a hollow in a patch of soil in one of our neglected flower beds. From the size, I suspected that the partridge had found a favoured spot to dust bathe, just like I've seen house sparrows do. And I was right. I was lucky enough to see her go to the hollow one evening and scratch and peck at the soil, kicking it backwards with her feet and throwing it over her back. When finished, she shook the excess dust out of her feathers. The one visiting my garden also has an unusual way of sunning itself. Usually, birds will spread their wings and tails, then lay flat on the ground. This bird lays almost on its side with the side of its head laying flat on the ground, the top wing opened along the body. It's a very strange pose and makes it look like there's a deceased bird lying there. Anyway, I'm very pleased that I've had the opportunity to observe these beautiful birds in so much detail. A bird that reminds me very much of the red-legged partridge is the California quail. I've only seen these ornate birds a few times, but they left a big impression with me. There's many species of quail that can be seen in America, but this is the only one that I've seen so far. The California quail is found, as might be expected, along the west coast of America. However, its range has extended as far north as the Pacific Northwest and inwards to Idaho and Nevada. It's found south into Baja, California. They prefer chaparral, open woodland and coastal sage scrub. Most recently, I saw one at Griffith Park Observatory. I was looking out over Los Angeles, enjoying the view, when I noticed a movement on the trail running below me. I was just in time to see a male California quail running along the path briefly before disappearing into the bushes. California quail are a smallish bird around the size of a medium aubergine or eggplant. They have a squat, round body and appear to have no neck. They have brown short beaks and brown legs with large feet. Like the red leg partridge, California quail have strong markings which help camouflage it. The males are most identifiable by the prominent plume on their foreheads, which reminds me of the headdresses of Vegas showgirls. Generally a blue-grey, male California quail have black faces, a white forehead line and chin strap, brown crowns and black and white speckling on the back of their necks. They have grey breasts and tails and a brown back. Their undersides are highly patterned with striped or scalloped markings, edged in brown and black. Males and females look somewhat alike, but the females have more muted markings. They also have a shorter plume on their head. When I was in Lake Arrowhead recently, Jenny from Nashville shared a story with me about the call of a California quail. Back when my boys were little, we lived in Ventura County in Southern California. We used to go hiking and birding a lot. And one of the easiest bird calls to teach my boys, who were at the time three and eight, was the California quail call, which basically is Chicago. Well, my youngest boy used to love to say that 
would repeat it regularly as we walked and practicing. One day when we were hiking, we hadn't had very much luck seeing any birds that day. And we're actually thinking of heading back to the car as we were tromping through some tall grass on this tiny little narrow path. And my younger son starts to say, Chicago! And of course, as mom does, I turned to him and I said, yes, honey, Chicago. And he went, no, Chicago, listen. And so we stopped. And sure enough, we heard the California quail call and started to look. And we turned around and crossing the path was a mommy and her little babies walking along and sharing their little Chicago call. And that's our story of hearing and seeing the California quail. Unfortunately, I do not have a recording of a California quail song to share with you. If you listen to the sound files on the Audubon website, you'll see that Jenny's impression was spot on. When we were staying on the Big Sur coast a few years ago, I heard a quail call most mornings. It would sit prominently on a branch in the morning. (coughs) They eat seeds, grasses and leaves, and also will eat berries and insects. They're generally found on the ground, scratching the leaf litter looking for seeds, but sometimes they'll forage in trees too. Like the red-legged partridges, if they feel threatened, California quail will burst suddenly into flight with whirring wing beats. California quail live in groups known as coveys, and they can often be seen strutting together. They will visit backyards, especially if seed is available, and I was excited to see several birds visit the garden of the cottage we rented on the Big Sur coast. They would eat the seeds I'd put out, and then find a suitable shrub or tree to roost in for most of the day. These are wonderful birds and I hope to catch more than a glimpse of them next time I'm in California. I love to hear about the birds you're seeing. Mort from Houston said in the show's Facebook group this week that he was continually chasing grackles away from stealing the sugar at sachets at the coffee shop where he works. I asked whether the grackles just like the sugar sachets, but he said that they actually break open the sachets and eat the sugar. I hadn't known that grackles would eat sugar, so that was quite interesting to learn. Alan from Savannah asked a question about the behaviours he'd observed from the cardinals in his garden. He said, Do fledglings need practice to build up their landing skills? Mama and Papa Red, the cardinals, were flying with teen cardinal yesterday. As they flew across the yard, Mum and Dad would do abrupt landings on the top of the fence, but Teen Red would always smash into the branches above the fence line, then jump down to the fence. Is this due to a lack of skill, or do you think he's doing it on purpose? One of the other listeners to the show, Adrian from Vancouver, responded, Based on my observations, young birds lack the skill, but they also sometimes lack the fine-tuned plumage, which can also make flying more precise, and sometimes it seems they just don't care. Flying is just a way to get to where they want to be and finesse just doesn't enter into it. As long as they arrive, they don't care how they land. I spend hours waiting for ferries every day, so I'm largely basing my theory on gulls. Their age is quite well indicated by their colouring. The younger they are, they're worse their ability to pull off tricks. The thermals and wind shear that occur as they fly in that zone between land and sea are quite extreme and infinitely variable. And the younger gulls tend to aim for larger flat areas such as docks, whereas the older ones will happily try landing on more difficult perches like thick wooden railings, and the mature ones almost seem to enjoy landing on tricky perches like the tops of polished steel lampposts. Later, Alan gave an update and said, Teen Red, the name of the juvenile male cardinal, stood atop my fence last night. He stood there and practised jumping, taking off and landing. He reminded me of driving around the church parking lot, practising parallel parking and timing the clutch. Thank you so much to Alan, Adrian and Mort for joining in the conversation in the Facebook group. It's really interesting hearing about the different behaviours you're seeing and the birds that you see too in your gardens. 
And I'd love to know what birds you've seen this week, no matter where you live. Join our Facebook group to discuss this week's episode. I'll post your photos of the birds you've seen. And I really do enjoy hearing your tales, so come and join the conversation there. Find us at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash casual birder podcast. Follow me on Twitter at casual birder pod or on Instagram at casual birder podcast. And you can email me at casualbirderpod at gmail.com. If you enjoy the show, please consider leaving a review in Apple Podcasts. And share the show with your friends and followers on Facebook or Twitter. Thank you to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is Short Sleeve Shirt by The Drones. Thanks to them for letting me use it. And check out their website at www.dronesmusic.net. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you'll join me again for another episode of the Casual Birder podcast. Podcast.